Um, now, get on to our our guest. That's actually, he's uh, I think moving forward, he's 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 going to have to get back into the swing of uh, waking up nice and early. And when he, I can see in the background now. I'm only guessing. It looks like you're in. Uh, where are you, Hughesy? Is that it looks a bit peanut farm? <laughs> peanut farm, and you know the peanut farm oval in St Kilda. Yes, I do, because I can see those palm trees in the background that are very St Kilda that I was actually going to guess that. Yeah, so that's um, that's where I'm at. So, yeah, I live in St Kilda, so, yeah, this is my hood. I uh, walk the dogs around here every day, basically, so that's a beautiful part of the world. Can get a bad rap sometimes, but <laughs> we love St Kilda. Absolutely love it. Now, off the top, Husey, I think on behalf of everyone, I did see a significant milestone come up the other day, my friend, in... Yeah. Had your fiftieth birthday, so happy birthday, mate! Did you do anything special? It was yesterday, in fact. So yeah, turned fifty yesterday. Um, look, we had uh, look uh, nothing special. I do a radio show in the afternoon, so they made a massive fuss of it on that. So, uh, mate, there was billboards up around Melbourne with me without a shirt on. It wasn't my body, but I was still happy to <laughs> see the six pack that I, uh, you know, could have one day. So. Yeah, mate, it's, it was a fuss was made of in because of the Sydney radio show, which I'll be doing next year. They, they did a sign writing thing above the Harbour Bridge, Happy Birthday, Husey. So that was, uh, <laughs> although they they missed they misspelt my name, which was um, great. So yeah, it was a massive uh, uh, sign in the sky above Sydney with the Husey with the missing H in the middle. So you know, I think it was a a good more a good uh, you know sort of reminder not to take yourself very seriously because you know. <laughs> Even when you're getting honoured, you basically can be a fool. So, now, yeah, so um, that was about it. Now, Husey, you've had a um, a lot of things that you've worked in in radio and TV, but I think the one that that really uh, I really love reading about that being on Neighbours and being uh, a, a being yeah. a hard man on there called Knuckles, and uh, of all people, uh, of all people that Knuckles punched out on Neighbours. You punched out Ian Bishop. Yeah, Harold. Look, you know what I mean? That's, 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 look, this is what it says on my Wikipedia page. That I punched out Harold, Harold from Neighbours. It's actually, that's actually a fabrication, uh, Corey. I was, I was on Neighbours for, and I played a farmer out in Upway, actually. It was filmed, but I never punched out. I never punched out Harold. And I, I mean, I would do it if that's what the script asked for, but they didn't ask for that. So, so but yeah, no, I appreciate that. Some smart ass uh, putting that on Wikipedia and then no one's bothering to take it off. Well, I could probably take it off. If I knew how to work out Wikipedia, I could probably take it off myself, but I don't. So, and, I, and I'm happy to answer the questions. You gotta, you gotta laugh at that, Husey, don't you? Like, especially, uh, you know, like in football and you're, and you're very well versed in, in AFL, but when you think of a Knuckles, he's like a real hard, tough guy. Just this vision of a Knuckles taking out one of the softer men in society. <laughs> In, in, in Harold from Neighbours. I, well, absolutely. It's like a you know Glen Archer moment, maybe, or you know Mick Martin. <laughs> I don't know some 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 hard man of the nineties, mate. You know, you're so yeah. popular. No, definitely wouldn't be me now. <laughs> now, once upon a time, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I suppose you had that dream of being a comedian. And you're doing labouring jobs in Perth. You got off to a, a like a, a pretty. Um, slow start like how like yeah how hard was it to actually sort of break into something that you actually obviously had a passion for yeah i mean it it was um yeah it was hard absolutely i yeah, i had a dream to be a comedian like as a as a teenager i didn't tell anyone about it and then you know i went to university but couldn't focus and uh you know, and the dream of being a comedian was still there so i did so i started when i was almost 22 or i think i might have been 22 i was in perth actually I'd driven over to Perth from country Victoria with a mate of mine called Rat. Me and Rat drove over there in his, in his panel van. Rat was a, a bricklayer. I was living with Rat. He's a good guy. Um, I remember my first gig in Perth was, went terribly. No one laughed at all. It was humiliating. And I got back to the flat I was living in with Rat in Scarborough, which is on the beach in Perth. And Rat says to me, how'd you go? And I says, not good. And he said, he said, do you know why? I said, not really. And Rat goes, you're not funny, mate. That's why. You're not funny. So <laughs> that was the inspiration I got from one of my closest friends uh, at the start of my career. But I kept going, mate. I kept going. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I said to myself, I've got to get on stage next week or I'll never do it again. 
And so I willed myself to go back to that same little comedy club and get on stage and do it again the next week. And I was a bit better the second time. So, yeah, that was that was a big moment for me. Do it straight away or you'll never do it again. Because when you die on stage, it is embarrassing. <laughs> so, anyway. How, like, uh, and that's probably also skipping forward a little bit. How, how hard is that? Like, it, it is a bit, it is a very much a, like a sportsman that's out in the middle of the MCG a lot that if you make a mistake and you and you have got a lot of people uh, I suppose looking at you how how tough is that when it actually happens on stage and you've got nowhere to run nowhere to hide because it is a lot like the MCG isn't it? Well, it's awkward because and uh, you know the difference between being a comedian and being maybe a musician or or an actor in a play is that you know people can assume you're doing well but with a comedian if you're not getting laughs. Everyone in the room knows. So it's like, it's like you know, you can't you can't pretend you're getting laughs when you're not. So um, yeah, it, it it's character building when it doesn't work. But you know what? It, 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 I remember that first gig that was just went terribly, and I was so embarrassed. But then I, I got after Rat said I wasn't funny. I had to think about it, and I thought, you know what? My feelings are hurt, but I'm not physically hurt. So it, it was, I actually did think. It's me who makes a decision to make this, you know, something or not. So, and yeah, and I had that, I had that sort of epiphany that, you know, I, I can, I can not worry about it because no one else is thinking about it. You know, no one else is thinking about me and the fact that it wasn't funny. It's just me thinking about it. So, you know, and you make a decision to not let it affect you, basically. Yeah, and is like you have obviously done had a long, long career in TV and radio, but is stand up still nearly like your great passion yeah i love it absolutely it's um you know, i've got to do it a few times in the last couple of weeks actually some of the gigs in melbourne are opening up did a did a gig to 60 people on the roof for the for, for transport bar at fed square last week and bloody loved it so yeah it's a real it's how i get my thrill i suppose my adrenaline rush comes from that so yeah it, absolutely it's been that's been a tough year in that respect not for me really financially because I've got other work, but for um, my passion, not being able to do my passion. So, and how yeah. how weird how weird is that, Husey? That can you imagine if we had a said twelve months ago that you'd be so excited about and talk about having gratitude about things uh, that doing a gig in front of sixty people that you you'd just be so over the moon about? Yeah, I look. I mean, it is. It's been such a strange year. But, but having said that, I, I, I've always, I'll do gigs in front of 20 people, 40 people. I, I love it. No matter, you know, if there's 20 people or a thousand people, I still love it. So, but it has made me appreciate it more, no doubt. So, yeah, but I, mate, I've always got on stage all over the place over the last 25 years, really. I'll take any opportunity because it's, uh, yeah, it really makes me feel alive. Yeah. And I think, like in a lot of ways, I, I touched on the sort of the sporting aspect of it before, but in, like being a comedian, I think sometimes is like from a performance point of view, it's, a, it, it's I've nearly likened it, it is a bit like sort of golf, that you've got to have that balance between, I know I've got to perform and I know it's still got to be fun, but at the end of the day, I've still got to be able to make some sort of money out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. So, look, it's... Uh... Look, I've been lucky um, with, you know, how it's worked for me financially. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of comedians who, who don't really ever cross that line into making a decent living. So it's tough for them. Absolutely. So, But then they love it. So, it's uh, you know, I would still do this. For, I'd still do comedy for free, though. And I still do do stand-up gigs for free. Because it's at the end of the day, it's that joy you get from those people laughing that it's just irreplaceable. So, and it, I mean, it's corny to say this, but it, you know, it's not, a, it really isn't about the money. It's about the, the thrill of that moment. Yeah. And then I, I think from a like setbacks point of view, what, what would be, what's been your, probably your biggest setback thus far? And then how did you, how did you manage to um, move on from it? Cause I know a lot of people we're always big when we do the walks about trying to give, uh, people a lot of tools in their kit bag and especially like in the in environment that's happened with COVID what's a, like what's been I think one of your biggest setbacks and how did you 
yeah, how did you manage to go about it um, and, and get yourself out of a sticky situation? Oh, look, to be honest, it probably happened early in my life. As in, and I know this is not an AA meeting, but, you know, I, I was a bad drinker as a, as a young bloke. And I was just, I was really depressed. I was like, you know, I could never control myself and was always embarrassed myself. And, you know, I did fail university and I was, I was feeling like a complete and utter loser, to be honest, um, back when I was like 20, 21. And you know what, Corey, the moment I stopped drinking was the moment my life turned around. And that's true. And um, yeah. that happened when I, I haven't, I haven't, I've been completely sober every moment of my life since 1992. So, you know, that's a, obviously that's a long time. So yeah. And that was, that's what got the control back for me from someone who felt like their life was spiraling out of control. Um, just decide, I decided to make my, myself in charge of my own mind. I, it's a corny thing to say, but I did, I decided to make, I'm not, not rely on anything else to make me happy, like, you know, any intoxicants. And from that moment on, I still remember, it was about this time in 1992, about a month before Christmas. Um, yeah, I, I've sort of, I set myself on a path of, um, you know, being happy, I suppose. That's really corny to hear that, to hear myself saying that, but I really did. And uh, yeah, I've, I really haven't looked back since then, if I'm going to be honest. Are you, are you, when you think of it now, and I think what I was like at 22 years old, are you, are you amazed now that as a 22 year old, you sort of had a, a lot of maturity to actually make that decision? Yeah, I, look, I, yeah, well, yes, is he, yeah, because I, I mean, I love the party, you know, more than, well, mo more than most. And uh, yeah, I was the life of the party and I was the funniest guy, but I was, you know, I'd always, I could never remember it the next day, you know. <laughs> it's like, and sometimes yeah. I'd end up in, in end up in the lockup, and it was like, what the fuck am I doing? So yeah, and that's to not drink in your in your early twenties is you looked at like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? You know, like <laughs> yeah. especially when I'm especially when I moved to Perth. Actually, the people in my hometown of Warrnambool, my mates who I used to drink with, they they really accepted it quickly, really quickly actually, and that was and that was great. But then you move to Perth, and I'm playing for the Scarborough Footy Club, and they're like, what's this guy? He doesn't drink. What's wrong with him? So. Yeah, to meet new people in that situation was really hard. But, you know, what I, I just knew that it was the right thing for me. So, just kept at it. Have you, um, uh, like, even over the journey, have you ever felt like having a beer? Like, even when your beloved Carlton have won the premiership in 1995? <laughs> or, or no, man, I, they've, uh, more, or they've more like very... it when they lost in 99. You know, I remember walking out of, walking out of the MCG uh, before the full-time siren in 99 and... Uh, I heard I heard the North Melbourne theme song play while I was walking past the Hilton Hotel. So um, yeah, so but I, but I still haven't. Uh, yeah, I, so I just I just made a decision and said that's it. I and mean, I still dream of drinking because I know how much fun it is. You know, so don't get me wrong. I, I know it's a, I know it's joyful for most people most of the time. But yeah, I just think it was, for me it was like nah, never again. Like like you you wouldn't you know. You wouldn't, you just, you just, it's like, you just, it's like jumping off a cliff. I, I don't want to do it. So, because I want to keep living. So, yeah, anyway. Well, I think, Hughie, when you heard that North Melbourne theme song, you know, apologies for that because I probably contributed to it. But, yeah, you definitely um, did, mate. Yeah. Um, I, I think all you had to do is just think back a week before and then that would have immediately put a smile on your face <laughs> straight away. <I'm... laughs> still, yeah. So, Carlton supporters know that there's still our last moment of joy, the 99 preliminary final. So, seeing the <laughs> Essendon supporters crying was, uh, they can never take that away from us. Now, um, I did hear. Tony Robbins talk about how Robin Williams, he made everyone else happy other than making himself happy. So have you, when I say, have you ever felt like that, that you seem like you're, you're really fantastic at making everyone else laugh, but are you always conscious of, of how Husey has got to look after Husey? Yeah. You know what? I, and even, you know, see, I, I'm still improving, you know, or trying to improve. And this is, true also i've really discovered meditation basically in lockdown and i tell you what i wish i had have practiced it 25 years ago so my main thing that's made me unhappy over the last 25 years is my own ego 
you know, where you're just constantly comparing yourself to others and fucking, you know, for me, it's like doing radio or TV or, or stand up comedy. I'm looking at ticket sales or ratings numbers for, you know, at TV shows or ratings numbers for radio shows and letting that dictate my happiness. It's just bullshit, basically. So, and you're never good enough because there's always people who are better than you. So, meditation's really helped me just give that, just get beyond that, you know, and it, and just, I, again, it sounds corny, but it really helps you live in the moment, you know, just enjoy this moment because nothing else matters. And uh, so that is something that I'm, I've absolutely committed to now uh, to do every single day, just 20 minutes, set an alarm and, you know, just, just, just let your thoughts settle basically. And I stare at a wall, mate. So to stare at a wall for 20 minutes and just think about not even just, just concentrate my breathing. And your mind just starts to settle and you, you start and you really start to see the bullshit that just goes on up there and, and, and you realise that it is all bullshit and, and none of it matters. And uh, yeah, so that's been a really good thing for me. And uh, Husey, like all the regulars on this walk, they've heard me tell the story that I, I wished I'd had a discovered meditation when I was actually playing football. Um, I think... To be brutally honest, if you actually called it a different word, and you've probably heard me say this, and I know I've said it on another interview, if you called meditation, just get the fuck out of your own way, a lot more people would do it. Oh, mate, yeah, I'd, yeah, again, I'd, yeah, I've followed your journey and, yeah, know that you had, and it's all ego based, isn't it? All the bullshit is ego based. It's like yeah. you're trying to compare yourself to how you were last year, or, you know what I mean? Like, and you can't, you're not you're not living in the moment, you know, and it's just fucking ridiculous. It's just we all do it to certain degrees, but we just don't need to. It's just like we're all going to be dust one day before we know it. And one thing I think about is what if you never know when your last moment's going to come? You know, we could be walking along here and fucking anything could happen. Touch yeah. wood, it doesn't. But imagine if your last minute on earth is worrying about some bullshit. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. and it's all bullshit. So why would you worry about anything? Yeah, and meditation really helps that, and, and uh, it's good to know that you're on you're onto it. It's better late than never, I say, mate. I've just turned fifty, and and the second half of my life's going to be a lot more fucking less busy in the mind. I'm not going to I'm not going to stop comparing myself to others. That's that's one thing I'm going to do. Now, is there is there any particular one that you like? That what what was the one that set you off where you went? Hang on, there's something in this. And just as a side note, I know there's. Um, I don't know whether you know, but Jerry Seinfeld is massive on transcendental meditation himself. I know he's a huge believer in it, but which I, which one in? I, which, I just found yeah, out that. Yeah, that that fact, the Jerry Seinfeld fact, I just found out, yeah, only a couple of weeks ago. And Carl Barron also, he's a great Australian comedian and also looks really relaxed all the time and, um, you know, doesn't seem to be as desperate as I am, basically. He's been doing it for years as well. So, mate, I, I think for me, it is that just stare at the wall. It's like, I don't have a mantra. I just, I haven't, I think it's similar to what they do at TIA, a transcendental meditation, but it's just 20 minutes and, but longer if you want to, of just coming back to the breath, just coming back to the breathing in between your, the, the, the air coming in, in and out of your nostrils, basically. And yep. just come back to that get i'm doing it with my son who's 11 and it's you know he's like a bit like me is a really an overthinker and so we're doing it before he goes to sleep and it's really helping him and i i hope that he keeps it up because i think it can i think it's really important for um everyone but also especially anxious people to do um yeah so that's just 20 minutes just just think about just just focus on the breathing come back to it whenever you get distracted yeah i think the one I think the one, as you mentioned, Hughie, the one with the kids, like even I, I'd love it if uh, I feel like it's nearly an, an advantage. You could actually give you your kids that a lot of other kids that wouldn't, especially in the, the digital age that we live in and distraction and everything like that. If you could give them a tool like this, it's something that I think that have just given them an amazing advantage. Absolutely. and But there's also... Yeah, it's going to help my son, no doubt about it. I've got to make sure he keeps doing it. But... um. But yeah, the phones, are, as you say, are really, they don't help us, do they? Because we're just bombarded with information 
twenty four seven. Like you just, you know, if you ever go and order a coffee and you don't and decide not to look at your phone, you look around. And everyone else is staring at their fucking phones. We're all staring at our phones the whole time, and it's agitating and it's it's unnecessary. So yeah, put the phone down as much as possible. Even when you when you're eating, mate, just eat. Don't do anything else when you eat. And that's you know that's also <laughs> can be a meditation. To stay in the moment as many times as you can a day. Try to stay in the moment. Yeah. Exactly right. Now, um, I suppose in today's environment too, like, do you have to think twice about sometimes the jokes you have to tell, knowing that people are very much oversensitive about a single word or a syllable out of place? I, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's definitely more of a look for me i've sort of probably gotten trouble or got uh, sort of focused on online a bit lately with uh during the uh lockdown i've been very vocal on twitter which is not that's not a zen place by the way twitter is not a zen place that you probably know you would uh, you would know mate there's not much there's not much meditation going on there so um yeah i mean you do i mean i i started trending on twitter the other day because i said joe biden was having trouble with the auto cue at one of his speeches, uh, you know, and then I found out he, he had a stutter as a child. But um, you know, but you know, that's an example of you know people trying to cancel me over that. So, but if you know your intentions are right, I think you've just got to wear some flack. You know what I mean? So, to a degree yeah. at least. Yeah. And uh, it was a few years ago. I, I, actually, it wasn't even a few years ago. I reckon it's only happened within the last year. The decision that you decided to go vegan what, yeah what prompted, again what prompted all that mate again it's um it's health reasons and it, my brother doesn't like it because he works at warnable cheese and butter factory so he doesn't even <laughs> like me he doesn't he doesn't like me talking about it because he thinks i'm going to ruin his business but uh mate i uh i watched that game changers a doco on netflix uh which is still available to look at and it was just people saying that they, they, their bodies felt better. And, you know, heading towards 50, I was getting so stiff. And, like, I wake up in the morning and have to go down the stairs sideways, you know, because my fucking body was so stiff. <laughs> and, mate, I've, it's been a year now. And, fuck, I'm not – I just do not get sore. I'm running every day. I'm running, you know, four-minute Ks. I'm, I'm 50 now, and I'm fucking – I don't get sore afterwards. I ran 10, 11 Ks the other day without being stiff whatsoever afterwards. And it just didn't happen before I became a vegan. It's fucking unbelievable. I honestly am just amazed at, I think dairy is an issue. I honestly do. I've got a mate who's got chronic pain and he's had arthritis from a young, since he was young. And I said yeah. to him about a year ago, I said to him about a year ago, I said, why don't you try getting off the dairy? He said, okay. And he's fucking, he's so much better now. He, he re I was talking to, I was literally talking to him yesterday and he said, it's absolutely amazing, you know, that how much better he feels. And he's a warnable boy who's not like a, you know, we're not talking Pete Evans style here, but we're saying, he's a, <laughs> there's something to think about. If you've got real sore muscles on a constant basis, generally you think it's just old age, give, give dairy a break and see what happens. Anyway, that's one tip. You didn't. Um, you didn't do it for the other reason that was in there, did you? That it, it, it made made the the downstairs department a little. Well, you bit know more what, active. mate. Well, it, you know what. Initially, it did, and uh, then I think that might have just been a placebo, though. So we're going okay. I'm going okay in that department. That's uh, with me, and my wife. Uh, she's yeah. We're we're good. And I, I think you do have to keep that going as well. I don't want to get too uh, crass here, but if you're in a relationship, you need to. Both of you need to make sure you continue to have sex, basically, you know, because <laughs> you can, you, it's pretty easy to drift off that. And I think that's unhealthy for a relationship. So we're, uh, you know, we're not like rampant, but we, uh, you know, it's, 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 more, it's more often than bin night. I'll say that much. <laughs> <laughs> now, now just on the good wife, uh, I did have a bit of a chuckle that, and a lot of guys would maybe attest to this, that marrying a, rep a reporter um, I think every husband nearly feels like their wife is a reporter. <laughs> yeah, she was a Herald Sun reporter for many years. And uh, I remember sometimes I would, uh, you know, someone would write a bad review of, of me and print it in the paper. And I imagine, you know, as a footballer, you would have got that as well, where, you know, you're thinking that's nasty what they've written about me in the Herald Sun. And 
I used to like, what, I used to feel like, can you go and tell that person to get fucked? You know, that, that works. <laughs> oh, I'm but just, no, I she's, a, she's turned into, she's a, a teacher now. So she's, um, yeah, she's uh, working at Gardenville Primary Schools as a primary school teacher now. So, so yeah, she wasn't, being a journalist didn't really suit her. She did it for 10 years, but she didn't want to you know, chase ambulances, to be honest. So, um, yeah, so she's enjoying being a teacher now. And uh, I suppose uh, in the in the teacher realm, how did how did you manage to uh, make it through lockdown? Now, I suppose in one sense, you might have picked up one good habit, which has been the meditation. But what was what was lockdown like in the Hughes uh, household? And how did you how did you manage to to get by? You know what? It was an incredible situation. One way that I man, I you know, being a comedian and being a workaholic, really, um, I used to travel a lot. And I'm not saying I won't travel a lot again, but having that six months or eight months where travel was just off the menu, I, you know, really enjoyed spending time with the kids, to be honest. So, yeah, so it was um, in a way, I mean, don't get me wrong, when school opened again, that with the first day of dropping them off was just like D-Day, you know, it was like, it was amazing. So, <laughs> but, um, but I have, I have enjoyed being around more and enjoyed, you know, being with the kids so yeah it's something i've got to be mindful of going forward that you know it's, it's important to be present in your in your kids life so in a way it was good even though fucking hell that was uh it was intense <laughs> now speaking of uh changes moving to sydney in 2021 where you're teaming up with Ed Cavalier and uh, Aaron Moylan. Aaron now. M- Moylan, yeah, yeah, from the NRL. Yeah, who, who, is a, who is a star. I've actually met her a few times and she's yeah, fantastic. She's great. And it'll be, how much of a change is that going to be moving out of your beloved change. Melbourne? Big change. I mean, I my wife's always been banging on about, let's go and live overseas for a year. And I'm like, yeah, all right, but what am I going to fucking do over there? You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not really known anywhere else. So I mean, you know, I could do stand up comedy, but you know, it's um and then an opportunity came to go to Sydney and I'm like, you know what, I've never lived in Sydney. I mean I love Melbourne, I've been here since nineteen ninety five, but to do something different I think is uh gonna be fun. So, um yeah, so but yeah, again it's a big change for the family, so and I've got to be mindful of uh, everyone being happy, so some of the kids aren't unhappy, to be honest. So, um, I've got to try to get them into the Sydney lifestyle. So it's going to be interesting. I, I think my uh, my meditation is going to come in very handy, Corey, over the next uh, 12 months, I can tell you. It will, it will come in uh, very handy. They might, and and I think the odd trip to Melbourne. Uh, no, nah, we'll, we'll mate, but there'll be, yeah, to watch the blues, but there will definitely, yes. mate, we'll be, we'll be up and back, especially the first year, will be up and back. So, yeah, there'll be going to be, a lot of time spent on tra- on planes, but yeah. So I'll have a house in Sydney and Melbourne, basically, for the first year. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, I-, I will open it up to the floor after I'll ask uh, my question here. And I've been asking it to a lot of people I've been talking to this year, Husey. But where was the fork in the road moment for, for Dave Hughes where things could have gone either way and then ultimately you'd like to think they went the other way for the good. So what was your fork in the road moment? I'm going to go back. I'll go back to, I've already said it, but I'll go back to 1992, the moment where I just said, you know, you know what was Christmas Eve, actually 1992. I I, I hadn't had a drink for like six weeks and, and Christmas Eve back then when you were a young bloke is a big night of drinking. You know, uh, I spent a number of Christmas days with a massive hangover, basically I was getting drunk again, but, um, and I said to myself, on that Christmas Eve, after six weeks off the grog, I said, I thought, you know what, if I start drinking again tonight, I'm just going to be like I was before. So that's when I made the decision. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to drink again. So that was definitely the fork in the road moment for me. So that was that Christmas Eve, 1992. No, nah, I'm not going to drink anymore. <laughs> 